Hi, this is Erin Owens. I'm the scholarly communications librarian in the Newton Gresham Library here at San Houston State University. In that role, I assist researchers across campus from undergraduate and graduate students up through staff and faculty with a number of different topics related to the research life cycle. Today, what I'm going to be talking about is using existing research data sets. This is a little bit of a look at our agenda. We'll go over some um, advantages and disadvantages of original data collection, and then talk a little about why other data sets are available, where we can find them and how we um, evaluate them, read them, and use them. So the first thing to understand is that most of our research is going to begin with some form of data collection, regardless of the field or discipline that we work in. We might run a survey, we might take measurements, we might collect samples or specimens, we might gather texts if we work in the humanities. There's any number of different ways that this might play out, but we're going to be gathering some kind of data to begin analysis. Obviously, there are advantages to conducting our own original data collection. We end up getting exactly the data points that we want or need for our analysis, and no extraneous data points that we have to sift through. We have a full understanding of what all the data points mean and how they were collected. We obtain the data in exactly the format that we want, whatever kind of arrangement and software we're comfortable using. We understand that the data we've collected will be timely in relation to our research. Obviously, the research may ask questions about a historical topic, but um, so the data itself may be from the past, but we understand that at least based on its collection, it will be timely in comparison to our question. However, there can also be some disadvantages of original data collection. For one thing, it can be very time consuming depending on what it is that we're collecting, um, waiting for that data to come in, there can be monetary costs involved, whether that means buying specialized hardware or traveling to specialized locations where we can um, obtain the data source. We have to meet a lot of compliance requirements to make sure that we're doing things legally and ethically in our research practices. There can be security concerns for ensuring that we protect not only the data itself, but protect the identities of any human subjects who may be involved with that data. And sometimes collecting our own data may simply require access that we don't have or that would be very difficult for us to obtain, whether that's access to a place um, such as collecting research that involves incarcerated people. We have to be able to obtain access to the prisons to speak with those people or obtaining access to a population, whether that's incarcerated persons or senior citizens or minor children um, materials. If you want to do research that involves uranium, but your ability to obtain access to uranium is limited. Um, so we face a number of different situations where there may be access challenges. In some cases, we may lack relevant knowledge, training, or skills to actually gather the data. If we had it there for us, we would be able to analyze it and draw conclusions, but doing the actual collection process may be beyond us as an individual researcher at this stage of our career. When we're working with human participants in particular, we can face recruitment challenges, difficulty finding enough people or finding people who meet the necessary criteria for our population. And particularly in those cases with recruiting humans, but even in non-human data, we may face problems of insufficient data points, simply not being able to get enough of the data to work with in a substantive and significant way. So what's the alternative? if we're not able to obtain this original data, we can leverage data collected by others. These may be other researchers who have access to advantages we don't have. They have grant funding, 
they have access to materials or populations, um, they have knowledge or skills that we don't have, whatever that may be, they face fewer barriers to gathering this data than we do, and so we can leverage the data as they collect it. Now, sometimes there's this sense of skepticism of, well, why would someone else's data be available? If data collection is so time consuming and expensive and requires these special skills and access permissions, why would it even be shared with someone else? There's a number of different reasons why this might be the case. It may be that the data was collected by a government agency, in which case it may by definition be public domain information that they then have to share with the citizens. It may be that the data was funded by a government agency, even if they didn't actually perform the collection. Um, and maybe they require the final data from their funding to be publicly shared. It may be that the agency which collected data hopes to benefit their cause through adding it to an existing data pool. Imagine that you're researching with the goal to cure breast cancer. If you gather relevant data and there is other relevant data out there already, or you envision there being additional relevant data in the future, you would want to combine forces, combine all of those sets of data to allow a greater opportunity for achieving your cause of curing that cancer. It may be that the data collector wants to better preserve their data. So it may be that they don't particularly care about sharing for any reason, but that by putting their data into a publicly accessible repository, they obtain the benefits of the preservation framework that that repository has in place so that they know their data will be maintained um, with a certain longevity and integrity for their use or someone else's. It might simply be the case that the data collector believes in mentoring and they want to share expertly collected data to then be used by others in teaching and learning. Finally, the data collector may simply believe that new insights can be found from their data in being used in new ways. And so they share it in order to benefit science, to benefit discovery, or to benefit humanity broadly. So we've established there are many reasons that existing data could be available to us. The next question then is, where would we find it? Now, this is far from a comprehensive list, but I wanted to highlight a few examples of the kinds of places where this data is being shared. UN data is the name of a data repository operated by the United Nations. Data.gov is operated by the US government and it's a place where they will provide their open data. I do think it's worth noting that the data they collect is not limited to the U.S. geography. So agencies of the U.S. government may be collecting data about other places, peoples, etc. around the world. So it can have a broader scope of relevance than just the U.S. Um, the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis operates this excellent repository known as FRED, the Federal Reserve Economic Data. Um, they have excellent data sets available for doing economic research. The Texas Data Repository is um, operated for Texas researchers to have places to deposit their data. So you might find data there on any number of different topics. The Harvard Dataverse is an interesting one. It is operated by Harvard University. And so obviously it does contain research from Harvard researchers, but they also allow for free deposit of data by researchers at other institutions um, who can then benefit from Harvard's um, funding and infrastructure to preserve and share that data. So again, it's a nice place to find a broad array of topics. The Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social Research, otherwise known as ICPSR. This is one we'll be looking at a little bit more in just a moment, but um, this is a genuinely excellent source for finding things in the socio-political realm. And we'll look at, a, again, we'll look in a moment at what kinds of things that might include. This is one that you can access through 
um, SHSU subscription to be able to download the actual data sets rather than just search them. And then the last resource I want to highlight here is the Registry of Research Data Repositories, known for short as RE3Data. This one is not a repository of data sets itself. It's more of a tool for discovering data repositories like those listed above. So you would be able to go and search for a topic and it would then identify for you repositories that are likely to contain data on that topic. You can read a little more about their scope, their creators, and then click through to those repository sites to then search for the actual data sets. So let's do a little bit of a field trip at this point and take a look at a couple of these sources. Let me change over to my browser for you. So the first site we're going to take a look at here is data.gov from the US government. Um, and you'll see they're telling you here how many, approximately how many data sets are available, which is now over 250,000. I'm gonna click on the data tab at the top and we get our search box here. So if we search for a broad topic like obesity, I just wanna give you a sense of the kind of range of things that come back for this search. So we will find information about um, Alzheimer's disease and healthy aging, nutrition, physical activity, um, obesity among children and adolescents, the food environment atlas, um, national obesity by state. So you'll see you're gonna get a number of different aspects of this topic or different lenses on the topic that you searched for. Um, under each of these results, you will see these colored buttons that identify the various formats in which you can download this data. Each individual data set may have different choices for download formats, but a format such as CSV will be very simple to import into Excel, SPSS, a broad range of softwares. Um, and in some cases you may find PDF files that you can read. They may be a little trickier to work with importing them into other analysis software. So you'll want to take a look at what kinds of formats are accessible to you and compare those to what kinds of tools you're going to want to use to, um, to take a deeper look at this data. So the next resource I want to highlight here is ICPSR. Um, we do obviously have a keyword search box again. You can put in terms related to your topic. But what I want to highlight here is some of the other options for finding data. So we're going to use the Find Data menu and choose Find Data. And I'm going to highlight here this box titled Browse. They provide a number of different options for you to browse the available data. You can browse by topics. And so this will break it out into broad areas like economic behavior, education, uh, legal systems, social indicators, choices there. Um, you can also browse by series. And I want to point this out because I think this is one of several different strengths that ICPSR has. They will have a particular data set which is collected on a regular basis, whether that's every year, every five years, every 10 years. And you will be able to look at the series and see all of these longitudinal sets of data to understand how that particular um, topic has changed over time. So browsing by series will give you a sense of which data sets they have that have these longitudinal views. So for instance, we can look at the annual parole survey and it will show us the list of every year that is available for this um, data collection survey. So we can see here 94, 95, 96, we're gonna get through um, the mid 90 or the late half of the 90s into the 2000s. And you can see exactly how many years of this, um, roughly 94 to 2018, that you would be able to analyze in comparison in any way that you need to. So that's a good option in, um, in ICPSR, in addition to being able to just search by topic. Finally, RE3Data is the other one I wanted to highlight. And again, this is the tool that will help you 
discover other repositories to then go and search for data. So if I search re 3 data for the term obesity, this is going to identify for me specific repositories, such as the National Collaborative on Childhood Obesity Research, the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Disease Information Network, um, and so forth. This does include um, repositories beyond just the US scope. So that's very helpful as well as that it's gonna give you an international view of data repositories. Once you do a search, it will give you a number of filtering options down the left-hand side where you could, for example, filter to a specific geography, a particular country, um, or particular kinds of, kinds of data, data formats, data licenses, et cetera. All right, so now I'm going to flip back to my slides, and hopefully that gave you at least just a little bit of a peek of what's out there with some of these tools. So once we've established that we can find some of this data out there, the next question for me is, how do I evaluate it? How do I assure myself that it is good quality, credible data that I can trust to reuse for my research purposes? In many cases, we can apply certain critical evaluation models that are the same as what we would apply to a published work. If we're looking at a book, a journal article, a website, and asking ourselves whether it is credible. There are several models out there that we can apply, such as ACT UP, RADAR, CRAP, you may have heard of others. Um, most of these come down to the same basic idea to think critically about who collected the data, why, and how. We want to determine whether, whether there are any problems of bias, inclusion, or completeness in the data, um, issues with timeliness, things like that, that might negatively impact our downstream research purposes. We also want to ask ourselves critical questions regarding um, the completeness of the data, the extent of missing data, gaps, um, who or what is included or excluded in the data. We want to ask questions about the data collection methods. Sometimes this may be difficult if it's only a data set that is not accompanied by um, a particular article or something that explains the methods, but we definitely want to question those methods to the extent that we can. We want to question data quality measures like rel reliability and validity. Again, it may be difficult if there's not um, more of a narrative tool that's going to describe that for us, but something that we want to look for. And then the availability of a contact person is another thing to really look at critically. Um, if a data set is not going to identify someone that you can contact with questions, then there's not necessarily someone to be held accountable. If something in the data is poorly collected, missing, misleading. So we really want to know that someone has been willing to put their name on this and to be held accountable for it to help us um, put some trust in its credibility. So once we've evaluated some data and we believe that it's some good quality, credible data that we can use, we need to make sure that we understand how to read and use the data. So there's several steps we can take here. We want to look for any documentation files that accompany the data. You'd be looking for terminology like data dictionary, code book, or maybe a readme file. Um, we want to take a look at these files and make sure that we understand the field labels and the definitions. So if you think about a spreadsheet in Excel, you have column headers. That's what we're talking about, is, is those types of labels. What is this column called? Do I understand what that label means? And then do I understand what is represented by the data captured in each of these columns? If the data has been coded in some particular way, we need to make sure that we understand how to translate that code into an actual data point that has meaning to us. So let's look at an example to clarify what I mean by this. So I'm going to use some data from the Carnegie classification system. 
This is the system used to um, categorize universities and colleges based on a number of different data points related to their enrollment, their graduation rates, um, how many doctoral degrees they graduate each year, their external research funding. There's this constellation of data points that's used to classify colleges and universities. And so when we hear about schools being an R1 or a tier one institution, that's based on their Carnegie classification. Their data is all publicly available. So here I have pulled out the row of data for our institution, for San Houston State University. Now, the first question I want to ask myself, I'm going to look at one of the items in this row and say, OK, I see a column called Basic 2021. And I see that in that column, Sam Houston is 16. So I need to ask myself, what does that column heading mean? What is basic 2021? I'm going to go and look up that variable in the um, data documentation. And I'm going to see here that basic 2021 is the name for this university's 2021 basic classification. So this is how the school was classified based on 2021 data. The next thing I need to do is look up the codes. So what does a 16 mean if that's our classification? So I'm going to go to the code book and it's going to show me that for the field basic 2021, you may find any value from 0 to 33, and that value corresponds to the name of a classification. So 16 corresponds to doctoral universities, high research activity. So I can translate this spot in the row as meaning that based on 2021 data, SHSU had a basic Carnegie classification of a doctoral university with high research activity. So we've ensured that we know how to read and understand the data. The next question is how might we reuse it? What are some things that we can do with existing data once we've found it and evaluated it? We could simply analyze that data set just as it sits to answer a new question. So someone else collected it to answer their question. I'm gonna ask a new question and interpret the same exact data. We could combine two or more data sets that have intersecting fields. And what I mean by that is let's say we have two data sets which record different social or economic factors by zip code. Because they have the zip code in common, we can merge them on that zip code. And now we can make new comparisons between the different factors that each data set recorded. We might collect new fields of data to add on to an existing data set. So we say, I'm going to start with these 10 fields that they collected, and maybe I'll collect two more fields, which will then allow me to expand the analysis in some new way. There are some questions we need to ask ourselves, though, about our capacity to reuse the data. So first, we need to um, think about the technical capacity. We need to make sure that we understand the format in which the data files have been shared. Um, is it Excel, CSV, SPSS, etc.? Do we have the needed software or hardware to be able to use the data, or can we convert it into something that we can use? We also want to consider the legal and ethical um, capabilities for reusing this data. So. We want to verify any type of license or sharing agreement that may be attached to the data. Make sure we understand what its creator has or has not given permission for us to do with the data. There's a nice tool online called the Data Sharing Wizard. It's like a decision tree or a flow chart to help you work through some questions and um, hopefully come to some conclusions about how you can reuse some data. And any time that you face questions or doubts about your intended use, um, I encourage you to either reach out to the 
data set creator directly and ask them for guidance or permission or to contact me and request help. I am always available to help interpret um, the existing license or sharing agreement or to help determine who to contact and how to inquire about a particular use. So I want to show you another example here from the Carnegie classification data website where we talk about licenses and sharing agreements. This is the license that is provided in the footer of the Carnegie classification website. And it tells us that this data is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial share alike license. Now we may not know starting out what that license indicates, but we would be able to click through to the details of that license and get a better idea of exactly what this license does or does not give us permission to do. In this case, I can tell you that um, a CC BY NCSA license will allow you to reuse the data. It will also allow you to edit or adapt the data set to suit your purposes under the conditions that your use is for a non-commercial purpose, that you credit the original creator, that's the attribution piece, and that any new work you create is also shared with this same license. That's the share alike piece. Uh, so, oh, sorry, I forgot this piece of the screenshot was here. So again, this, this shows you um, what this license says. You are free to share and adapt under these terms of attribution, non-commercial, and share alike. Last point I want to touch on briefly here is how do we cite existing data sets that we are reusing? The essential components of a data set citation are author, title, date, and a publisher or distributor. So a little bit different than a published source, but you can see that it's really following a very similar format. We want to be able to say, what is this work? Who created it? Um, and when? And where did I find it? So I'm going to show you a couple of examples here. According to the APA citation style, this is a citation for this data set that shows the creator and year, the title of the data set, and then ICPSR is listed as the publisher or distributor. That will often be the repository where that data is hosted. And then we've included the um, DOI as a persistent locator for where someone could find this data set. Here is a similar example, but done in the MLA citation format. So Pew Hispanic Center, um, in this case, the data set is authored by an organization rather than an individual, so they're the creator. We have the title of the data set and the date of creation, and then the um, Pew Research Center is cited as the publisher or distributor, as well as the creator. <laughs> and then we have the URL there for where the data set could be found. So these at least give you some guidelines or some ideas of what your data set citation may look like couple of additional resources that I want to share here as we wrap up. You can find links to more examples of data repositories in this library guide um, and this page as well of databases that contain either raw data sets or aggregated statistics. We also have a library guide available for data wrangling tools. So if you need to find some tools to help you clean, analyze, or visualize these existing data sets, or your own original data sets for that matter. We have an excellent guide to some of those resources. Um, finally, I do want you to think of me as a resource on our campus. You are always welcome to reach out to me with questions about um, data or any other topics related to the research lifecycle um, up through scholarly publishing and beyond. Um, you're never interrupting me when you have questions. This is in my job description to help you with these topics. So you're always welcome to reach out by email, or I do actually have an appointment scheduler online, so you can compare your calendar to mine, 
find a time slot that works for you and schedule to meet with me, whether that's in person or by Zoom or telephone. So with that, I'm gonna thank you so much for joining me. I hope this recording has been useful and I hope to speak with you in the future about your research. Thank you.